Well, once again, good morning. I'm glad you are here with us. Uh, last week, Smed uh, mentioned that I would be preaching on the 25th, and actually I have a, a schedule conflict on that week, and the other guys uh, were so kind and accommodating to switch and, and let me preach this week and really share my heart for what we've been talking about the last couple weeks in regards to a church plant. And really, I don't have any obligation on the 25th. I was just so excited to talk. I came up... <laughs> I'm kidding. I do have an obligation. Um, the last few weeks, last couple weeks, uh, we have been talking about missions and the church. And Smed mentioned two weeks ago the elders' intention to plant a church with me in the East Valley. And then last week, we had a little bit more details given about the plans for planting a, a church. And I think we expanded that information to the Southeast Valley which totally satisfied all of your questions and desires about our plans. As I've interacted with many of you in the church, it's been really sweet, and yet there's a, a huge range, I think, in the response of uh, people's preparedness, maybe just mentally, emotionally for something like this. Everything from excitement over two decades of waiting for such an endeavor to Shock, I thought you were going to be here forever, and uh, why do we have to do something like this? And, and everything in between, and that's understandable. And what I want to do this morning is I, I want to, well, and then there's probably a third category of those who have missed the last two weeks and are here this morning and going, wait, what? <laughs> what are we, guess what? We're planning a church uh, in the Southeast Valley, Lord willing, somewhere either in or close to, very close to Gilbert. That, that's the destination, somewhere along the 202, uh, within a, a couple or a few miles from the southern 202 in the Southeast Valley. That's what we're aiming towards. And last week, or two weeks ago, Smed set forth uh, really our, our vision for missions in gospel, glory gospel church world, and set that before us. And then uh, last week just did a, a wonderful job talking about God's blueprint for the church. And you know, I'm just gonna, can you bring the lights up? Oh, there you are. Okay, good, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and what I wanna do today is I wanna talk about sending out and really uh, give uh, an explanation, a description of some key components that must have really have led us to this point and must be a part of what we do moving forward. The very vision and purpose of this church is to be God-glorifying, Christ-centered, and life-transforming. That's the vision. And our purpose that was set before us from the elders was to draw in, build up, and send out. And what we're going to do this morning is I want to put before you four factors leading to a church plant in the Southeast Valley. Four factors leading to a church plant in the South. East Valley. And I'm going to put these four factors just up for you for a moment first so you can see what we're going to be looking at this morning. And that's the path, the need, the goal, and the means. The path, the need, the goal, and the means. And I want to start with the path. And what I mean by the path is, is really the path for, for my family, where this all started. Um, for some, I think it was a bit of a surprise, and uh, the fact that it was a surprise was a bit of a surprise in light of what the last almost two decades of my life have been about within the church. And so hopefully it'll be helpful to hear a little bit of the roadmap of where the Lord has bought, brought me and my family. Go ahead and open up your Bible to Romans. We're going to jump around a little bit this morning, and I just want to start with Romans 12. The Lord was extremely kind and gracious to me. He saved me at a young age. And from uh, the earliest time of being in Christ, I had a desire for the local body. Had a desire to be part of the church. I was regularly active and serving within the body. And Julie also shared this passion. And as we started dating, we were uh, really connected at the hip within this church from before it was even planted. 
in the ministry that was sent out, serving together. We were part of the church plant here. We were faithfully serving and we were involved with really no thought at that point in our life for anything other than active lay ministry that we had enjoyed up to that point. In fact, being a younger Christian in my uh, mid to late teens, I was very active in various ministries. And oftentimes people would ask me, uh, have you ever thought about full-time ministry? And I, I found that question a little bit concerning because their, their observation was, here's a young man who loves the Lord and is serious about Christ. He must need to be a pastor. And um, while that was a really kind sentiment, I, in my youthful pride and arrogance, uh, would respond with, absolutely, the Lord's called me to full-time ministry. I was working at Bank of America at the time. I'm going to work and be a businessman, and I'm going to give generously and evangelize actively and serve faithfully in the local church, and that's going to be my full-time ministry to the Lord. Um, I hold to today the importance of that kind of role and participation in the church. Hopefully, I would hold it a little bit differently in how I would communicate somebody who's trying to compliment me and encourage me in the Lord. <laughs> but that, that was my heartbeat. The church needs faithful members who are active in serving and intentional with the gospel. That was my passion, and that's how we were serving. However, within the first two years, before the first two years of our church being planted, we went through a very tumultuous time, and the church found itself with many needs um, that were left. And through this, the Lord opened doors for areas in which Julie and I were able to step in and to serve and take on more leadership responsibilities. Uh, we went from... I, I, I categorize it or, or summarize it as third string junior high leaders, even though we were barely out of junior high ourselves, to there were no other people um, available, able to serve the youth ministry at that time. They had all left. And so Julie and I uh, met with Brian Iserman and said, we have no idea what we're doing. We feel like Isaiah going, we have unclean lips, we live among the people of unclean lips, but we hear this need off in the distance and we're just saying, here, here we are. If you, if you think it would be appropriate, we have no idea what we're doing, but we'll love the students and we'll put God's word in front of them. And we started leading student ministries for the first time. There's been several rounds over the Lord. Maybe the Lord's trying to tell me something. Maybe we need to play in a youth ministry. No. Um, that, that was the first time where we started leading the student ministries and over time, uh, there was a need in the music ministry, and Julie and I were confronted with um, having to choose, because of the timing, whether or not we, I would lead the music ministry in the church or the youth ministry, and there was other people, namely my brother, who could step in and lead the, the student ministries at that time, and there, was, there, there really was, honestly, nobody else who played an instrument in the church, and, uh, and so I was it. I, I'm what you guys got stuck with. And 18 years later, here we are. And, and I still have the joy of, of participating and leading that ministry. But that's, that's how I started taking on more leadership responsibilities. And around that time, when I started leading music, pretty much at exactly the same time, the church hired Scott Maxwell to pastor alongside of the other elders here at Grace Bible Church. And that began just a tremendous mentorship, discipleship, friendship relationship with Scott, where he was meeting with me every week um, to help equip me for uh, the ministry that I was doing and, and Lord willing, maybe the ministry that the Lord would open up down the road and just an invaluable, I mean, countless hours that Scott spent with me and so patient, so kind um, in, in our meetings and so helpful, so, so helpful, that kind, of, that kind of relationship where there's an older man pouring into a younger man is just invaluable to the church. And so about 17 years ago, 16 years ago, something like that, at a Sweet Tomatoes on Southern and McClintock having lunch with Scott, I asked him the question, how do you know if you're called to pastoral ministry? And that really started a conversation between me and Scott and me and the elders that has gone on for a significant amount of time. And as we were having those conversations, I started pursuing every opportunity for additional training, additional type, uh, 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 discipleship, additional mentoring, additional equipping for ministry. And as Julie and I talked about it, our resolve was really, we, we don't know what God's calling on our life is, 
But every single way we've church, we've served in the body, whether it was setting up chairs with a laser level, moving trailers, emptying trailers, setting up music equipment, leading student ministries, leading music, teaching God's word, leading a small group, whatever way we were participating, we just had an insatiable love for the church and for Christ and to see others built up in Christ around God's word. And at that point, it didn't so much matter the specific task, but, um, but just serving, just seeing Christ glorified, seeing him exalted, seeing God's people built up. And really a verse that resonated on my heart from the very get-go and, and still all along today is Romans 12. And I want to share that with you. And this is actually, um, this is actually the, first, the first two verses of Romans 12 were the first verses I preached to Grace Bible Church on a Sunday. And I strongly encourage you to not go look it up. <laughs> it was about 15 years ago. I have no idea what I said, but what I do know is that if you do go back and listen, you will be all the more convinced of the necessity for TES type training within the local body <laughs> and the benefit of it in the lives of the young men of the church. Romans 12, I, I want to look just at these verses. I want to look all the way through verse 6 because there's something really important to understand about the connection between the first two verses and what Paul goes on to talk about. Romans 12, starting in verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. And what all what has always stood out to me is really exceptional is first of all, all of this is founded on the mercies of God, right? The most robust consecutive explanation of the gospel of gospel realities, Romans one through 11 summarized by the mercies of God, by everything that Christ has done and who he is and what he's accomplished, present yourself back to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. And then he goes into the specific function of individual members within the body of Christ actively serving in accordance with their giftedness, not in pride, not in arrogance, not thinking highly of yourself, but simply exercising faithfully the giftedness that the Lord has put on each individual member. How wonderful is that? How challenging is that? That as we contemplate living a life of worship that is different from the world, that is manifested through an interconnectedness with one another, where we are serving one another sacrificially for the building up of the body of Christ. This has resonated in my heart and my mind for years. And as time went on, my passion for the local church and serving was growing all the more. And it didn't matter if I was doing whatever I was doing. I, I just love to serve. And so Julie and I intentionally structured our lives around active participation in the body. We didn't structure body life around our lives. And so the jobs that I chose to take we chose with the thought of how can we be flexible to be engaged in body life and meet with people and be discipled and, and Lord willing, disciple others. As this ongoing discussion and trajectory of pursuing ministry all the more and pursuing equipping transpired, I looked for any and every opportunity to be trained and so build and we had EMT for a while where Scott met with a couple of the guys. Early morning training is what we called it. I did a training center training at another church for a couple years. 
And the resolve in me and all of this was not that there was a specific ministry that I had to fulfill, but that I wanted to be near to my elders so that they could evaluate my character and my equipping and my usefulness. And, and my determination was that God would reveal the gifting through my elders and reveal what ministry the Lord would have for me. But my ambition, my desire was to be the right kind of man character wise and to be faithful equipping wise so that whatever the needs were, it would, it would be a matter of need and equipping or a matter of need and gifting, not character or equipping. And that's what I've pursued for the last 17, 18 years. All with the thought of embracing the very purpose that this church seeks to accomplish, which is to draw in, build up, and send out. And I didn't presume upon the Lord or the elders of what ministry awaited me and what it must have to be in the future. But as we made decisions about what ministries I participated in and what opportunities I would be given, the elders were strategically working to equip me and train me to be able to serve the body of Christ with God's word and the shepherding responsibilities of elder, of, pas of eldering, of pastoral leadership, of preaching and teaching and counseling and serving the body in that way. So I've had the privilege of teaching in student ministries and have loved that. I've worked with the young adults. I've worked with small groups and music and a number of other areas in this church. And all, away, all, all along the way, God's word always had to be a part of my ministry, but as I've had more opportunity to preach, the Lord has just kindled that passion and that desire, that zeal for that. Not that it was, wasn't there before, but it's just increased all the more. And so for 15 years, we've had active conversations with the elders. The elders together have had active conversations about what it would look like to plant churches locally and to not become one main huge mega church, but to have a body the size where the, the elders know the sheep and can shepherd the flock among them and can build up the sheep and equip the sheep for the work of ministry and the, the body can function effectively and someday down the road be able to multiply and send out. And as we've had discussions, even the location of this building was chosen with the specific intention of what would be a good centrally located hub to start planting out in the valley and to spread out. And in these conversations, considering the, the many in our church who live in the Southeast Valley, it's always been on our minds that that would be an excellent uh, starting point for a church plant to, to send in that Southeast Valley. So we've been having these discussions, we've been enjoying these conversations, and it's ebbed and flowed the intensity of these conversations based off of where the church was and where we were as a body and what we thought we could do. And so the timing has just gone with those conversations where it wasn't um, yet time to act. And we were getting closer and closer and something would come up, oh, we really need to, uh, to focus on this, to accomplish this, to address this. Um, and then the, the greatest or, or most recent interruption to this path, path was nine months ago uh, when our five-year-old son Caleb passed away unexpectedly. And for those of you who have been a part of our body, you know well the circumstances of that and all that came with that. For those of you that are, are maybe visiting or, or are unaware of that, there was a tragic accident as we were coming home from vacation. I thought the kids had dispersed behind me and uh, two of them had, Caleb did not. He found his way in front of my truck and I uh, pulled forward and, and ran him over and he passed away quickly. And so that was an un unexpected uh, hiccup in our, in our, from our perspective. It, it was God's divine plan um, for our good, for his glory, that we're just so grateful for his faithfulness in the midst of that. But that, that really just put a pause on, on everything in my life, in our lives at that moment. And it, it, was really, it was really staggering, even the night that Caleb had passed away, Julie and I, in our real, really just agony, I mean, that we were just hurting so deeply, so shocked, so undone, um, you know, all wind was out of our sail, and yet as we were discussing that evening, um, 
the circumstances we found ourselves in, our, our cry together was that we wanted the Lord, we weren't left wondering what God's intention was in this. We were fully confident of God's sovereignty, of his goodness, of his plan in all of these things. We knew he intended it for our good to be more like Christ. We knew he intended it for this church's good to grow in maturity and, and holiness as a body. We knew that he would use it in wonderful ways, and we were completely satisfied with that. What we weren't satisfied with was being passive about him using it that way. And so we talked very intentionally, even that night through our tears, we want to squeeze every ounce of what God would want to do in us and through us out of this trial because it was so costly. And so the, the way I've thought about it is like a, a, roll, a, a tube of toothpaste that you've overused for a month. We just want to just roll it and squeeze it and scrape it to get everything out. That's what we want to do with what the Lord has given to us as our lot in this life. And yet the reality was our sorrow was so intense, we had no idea what that would look like in that moment. Even the next day as we met with the elders and I told the elders, guys, I'd, I don't know if I'm even qualified to be a pastor anymore, if I've brought reproach on the Lord or this church in any way because of this accident, um, whatever you guys say goes, and, and I'm willing to step down if that's what's best. And was quickly admonished and rebuked for that thinking and, and helped in my wrong thinking in that, which was, was really great. But what happened was all of my ambition beyond the day just went away. I was merely just trying to not sin against the Lord in my sorrow. I was trying to be uh, faithful as a husband, faithful as a dad. I didn't want to miss out on what God would want to do through me in my wife's life, in my kids' lives, because of the intensity of my sorrow. I wanted to be, I wanted to be faithful. And so we took some time away from uh, a lot of the normal rigors of my pastoral responsibilities and spent time as a family and um, just wonderful, sweet time. So grateful for, for my family and the way that the Lord has grown my family and blessed my family. The way that you all came around us and cared for us was just, uh, just can't even begin to describe uh, the ways that the Lord used you all in our lives. Well, as I stepped back into ministry, I told the guys, I said, all, all the wind is out of my sail. I have no vision beyond today, but I need to work. I want to be faithful. Point me in a direction. And so they gave me some tasks to step back into and to work towards. And as I started doing that, had conversations about wanting to teach a short series on how God had demonstrated his faithfulness in the midst of our loss. And that from that came the divine provisions of a good God that I had the privilege of sharing with you all. And uh, that three-week series, during that three-week series, um, when there was a, a need again for leadership in student ministries, um, the plan has been, is, for me to temporarily step back into that need while we, while we navigate um, a very good long-term, longer-term solution than me for the pastoral leadership that's needed in that ministry. But when I stepped back into that, in all honesty, it was like a switch flipped one day. I went from, I just can't think beyond today, to my mind's going 100 miles an hour. And um, knowing myself my own emotions, my own fickleness. I said, I'm just going to sit on this and I'm just going to be faithful. But I started hearing of things going on in churches in the Gilbert area. I started contemplating the needs for the gospel to go forth. And the Lord really kindled a passion in my heart. And I, I just kind of uh, sat on that and waited. And early in May, I was having a conversation with Smed and uh, Smed really just kind of drew me out on where my heart was at in regards to ministry and pressed me a little bit. Um, Josh, what do you, what, what's on your heart? What do you want to do with your life? I, I just love what I get to do now. just want to be faithful. What do you, what do you want to do? Oh, but no, just whatever the elders want me to do. Josh, what do you want to do with your life? I want to plant a church in Gilbert. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. We've only been talking about that for 15 years and praying to that end for 15 years. And I think we should... I think we should bring that to the elders. And, and so we did. And, and that's where we are. And it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful evidence of how God has used you all in this process. 
because I pursued all these different programs, but the programs aren't primarily what produced a man that the elders would consider moving forward with. This church body, the growth that has happened from what Omri talked about this morning in equipping hour, in the, the regular counseling, admonishment, building up of one another, what Smed spoke about last week in regards to Ephesians 4, the body functioning properly, building itself up together. And that's where we are. That's the path that the Lord has brought for us to get here. And, and Julie and I are both just completely united and completely thrilled uh, with the elders' plan to, to send us out to plant a church in Gilbert, although we know it's costly, we know it'll be hard. This is the only church we've known our adult life, and to be a part of any other body under any circumstances will be hard and emotional, and yet the need is great. And that's what I want to talk about next is the need. What's really driven us to this? First of all, there is a need for a healthy Bible church in the Southeast Valley. Why? Well, as most of you know, many of you know, if not all of you know, the Southeast Valley is the Mormon central hub in Arizona. There are thousands of men and women and children who have embraced and believe a heretical false gospel that gives no hope for them in eternity, and they will face judgment. And should they not hear the true gospel and should they not repent, they, all along while thinking they are good enough in this life to merit all sorts of things that scripture doesn't speak to, will end up standing before Christ, giving an account unto condemnation, experiencing eternal judgment, damnation, punishment for their sins that they thought they covered with their own righteousness. They need the gospel. They have to. And if a Bible preaching, gospel teaching, Christ-centered church is not planted, who else will go into those communities? And not only Mormon unbelievers in the area, but additional unbelievers. Gilbert has become quite popular as a family-oriented city for people to go and experience, experience camaraderie, and, and it's an attractive place for many people to live, and so many unbelievers, maybe not Mormons, additional unbelievers who need the gospel. They need to be drawn in. They need to be saved. Scattered, hurting believers. It's been a unique season the last two years. And the combination of churches navigating social justice issues along with uh, COVID and all of the implications like that, there have been a lot who have left their local churches under many instances of good discernment to know that they shouldn't be behind specific things that maybe their church was pursuing. And yet they're scattered and they're hurting and they're looking for a church home in their immediate community that teaches the Bible, that, that is, is faithful to God's word, that pursues what God calls the church to pursue and seeks to be what God calls the believer to be collectively within the body of Christ. Also in the need for a healthy Bible church in the Southeast Valley, there are members of Grace Bible Church who live in the Southeast Valley and for many years, over a decade, some almost two decades, have served faithfully, sacrificially, intentionally with limitations because of proximity on their service and have longed for and desired a church home in their immediate neighborhood. I've had conversations with neighbors where I have shared the gospel, invited them to church, and the moment they heard the word Tempe, they were out of the conversation and they were talking about a mega church in Gilbert that they were going to go to instead. Now, the location of the church 
is not the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is what saves. Our hope of people coming to Christ is not if we can just position the church in this way and do all these other things to get them there. But if there's a way to remove obstacles to people's engagement, to coming and seeing and hearing collectively what we believe individually, We'd love to do that. And the benefit to be able to minister in your immediate neighborhood is significant. For those of you that live three to five miles away, or maybe one to five miles away from Grace Bible Church, think about the implications on your level of engagement, how you can serve, how you're able to serve, versus if you lived 25 miles away. Well, there's some who live 25 miles away, and they navigate that all the time, faithfully. And yet the benefit of having a local body in their immediate neighborhood would only bolster their already faithful service in the body. Well, as we consider planning a church in the Southeast Valley, that those needs are, are absolutely crucial to, as to why we would plant a, a healthy Bible church in the Southeast Valley. But there's something else we have to keep in mind as we consider this endeavor. And that's the need to maintain the health, maturity, and fruitful ministry of Grace Bible Church. We are where we are today because of faithful labors over two decades. What we don't want to do is, is what Smed alluded to last week, which using the oak illustration of splitting the tree in half and both dying. We have to be able to plant in a way, this is an absolute need, where we can maintain the health, the maturity, and the fruitful ministry of Grace Bible Church so that we can do it again. We're already on an active, intentional path to that end with Omri Miles to New Orleans. And if we're going to plant in Gilbert, we do not want to lose the momentum of what this church is doing to build up one another for the sake of sending out. And Omri should not, cannot be the last man that is sent out. We need to do it again and again and again. And so as we ponder the, the needs to planting a healthy church, we can't neglect the needs that are going to be present within this church for Grace Bible Church to all the more be faithful to an Ephesians 4 disposition towards the local body where we are connected. We are not spectators coming to receive a product, but we are active participants in the body of Christ using what God has given us to build up the body. If you are a believer in Christ, you are gifted. You have a spirit gift from the Lord, and you need to employ it for the building up of the body, for the benefit of the saints. The equipping and building up of the saints is absolutely crucial. TES and the role of the classroom is important. The fact that we're a TES campus is such a valuable, valuable resource for this church. But the training and equipping of men doesn't begin and end with their entrance into the classroom and their exit from it. What makes TES TES is all of you being faithful, connected with one another, maturing and growing in the Lord, pouring into one another, including the seminary students. I remember uh, about a year and a half, two, two years into my seminary training, we were having a study together in our small group. And whatever passage we were in, I can't remember the specific passage, but we were doing a study and we had a conversation about what the passage meant. And I had just learned how, how a Greek, how a verb, particular verb functioned in Greek. And so everybody's going, I think it means this. And I'm going, well, actually, the Greek means this. So it has to be this. Everybody go, oh, okay, all right. That week in class, we talked about the exceptions to the rule that I had just employed. <laughs> and the primary verse that was an example was the verse that I had corrected the small group regarding. So that next week, I came back to small group and said, hey, guys, remember? Do you remember this, Tyler? Do you remember this when this happened? Kind of, sort of. I remember it really well. <laughs> It took a lot of work in the Lord's uh, on my heart. But I, I came and I said, guys, um, I, got, I was wrong. <laughs> Thank you for being so patient with me. And you know what they did? 
They kicked me out of the small group and said, you got it wrong. You're not allowed to be a part of the small No, they did it. They said, oh, that's okay. I'm glad we got it figured out. Yes, God's word's great, and we love you, and yeah, keep, keep studying, you know? <laughs> it, was, it was so sweet. We need that. We need to have that kind of disposition. We need, we need seasoned, godly saints to help humble, ambitious, godly young men. We have to be able to pour into one another. <laughs> Excuse me. Next, the goal. Well, what is the goal in all of this? The goal, the ultimate goal, cannot be to plan a church in Gilbert. The united goal that we cannot compromise, we can't let up on, is this. We want to please the Lord. That's the goal. That's the aim. That's the target. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. Smed taught on 2 Corinthians 5 at summer camp and really did just a, a masterful job. It was so good. And I think he intends to teach it at a, an equipping hour or something like that soon, it, it, which he has to. It was so helpful, so beneficial. But I want to read verses 6 through uh, the first half of verse 11. So 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 6, Paul says, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Then look at verse 9. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. That is the ambition that we are to imitate we must also have as our ambition, and then look at verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of, men, of, fear of the Lord, well, that was, a, that was a misspeak, not the fear of men, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we are active and intentional about the ministry that the Lord has for us, is what Paul is saying. Paul in verse 9 says we also have as our ambition, our aim. It's what we aspire to. It's what it is. It is our honor to pursue. Our goal is to be pleasing to Christ Jesus. To please Jesus. Our supreme concern above all, all else is that Jesus is pleased. And for clarity, this is not for the purpose of gaining his saving favor. This is the result in the heart of one who has received this undeserved favor. This is what God does in the heart of a Christian who has been saved by grace through faith. We don't want to please God because we just want him to accept us. God demonstrated his love for us when we were godless, helpless sinners and provided a way of reconciliation through the work of Christ. It is Christ's work alone that reconciles. It is Christ's work alone that saves. It is Christ's work alone that redeems. It is Christ's work alone that God has used to grant to us a righteousness we do not possess so that we are viewed as if we had never sinned because we have been covered with Christ's righteousness. It all starts there. And yet in response to that, our response is to be an active pursuit of pleasing our Lord who has saved us. That is our ambition as one who is under his grace. It is an unwavering preoccupation with pleasing the Lord. And Paul says, whether home and at this point, as he's used these words interchangeably, to be home in the body is to be absent from God. But now here he's saying to be home is actually to be with God, be with the Lord Jesus. 
To be absent is to be absent from this body. Either way, our ambition is to please the Lord. And what we're to aim for in this life is what we will perfectly aim at and accomplish for all eternity, to be pleasing to the Lord. Personal holiness, fidelity, faithfulness to God, embracing the ministry that the Lord has given to you. All to please the Lord. What Smed preached last week from Ephesians 4 is absolutely essential. Before you start to consider, should I stay at Grace Bible Church? Should I go with the plant? You should be asking yourself, am I connected, functioning properly as a useful instrument for the building up of the body of Christ in love? Is my life, is my conduct pleasing to the Lord now? Because whether I stay or whether I go, I will be most useful if that is my ambition. And if anything else is your supreme ambition, you will stunt greatly your usefulness in either endeavor. If on your mind is that the church plan is kind of the, the kickstart that you've needed to really kind of embrace what God calls you to be in the church. Man, I, I've been lacking, and I think the change of center, scenery or the excitement, that'll really stir within me where I know I should be. There's some work that you need to start now. Liken it to, to the missionary or the, the young individual who wants to be a missionary. Oh, I, I can't wait to go to this other country and I'm going to share the gospel. I'm going to be faithful with God's word and all oh, the excitement of the missionary work. I just, it's going to give me such enthusiasm and, and I'll share the gospel when I go to this country. And then you start to draw them out and talk to me about who you've shared with, shared the gospel with this last week. Go. Oh. Well, I can't wait to get there because, oh, Tell me about who you've shared the gospel with this last year. Silence. The change of scenery is not going to innately, just in and of itself, create faithfulness. Be faithful now. Your greatest opportunity to aid this endeavor will be today being what God calls you to be as a follower of Christ and pleasing the Lord. As you do that, as we do that together, God will bring clarity to some of the other questions that we have to consider as we walk down this path. The primary obligation of each of us is not to determine the plan, the participants, the location, the timing that is pleasing to us, but how can we be pleasing to God? And then look again at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This is the believer's judgment before Christ. Not unto condemnation, but unto reward. We give an account for how we stewarded what he has given to us. The Lord has given to me and my wife and my family, a lot that we never could have imagined and could not be more thankful for. And yet the most recent circumstances was a portion that we never would have dreamed of. We want to stand before the Lord. He knows what has taken place in our lives. He knows the hurt, the pain that we navigate every day. We want to stand and we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. At whatever the cost. We love this church. Love this church. And I don't think that there's anything else that would draw us away from this church than the thought of God placing before us an opportunity where we would hear those words because we acted. to be an unashamed workman on the behalf of Christ. 
not even 120 degree summers could drive me away from this church. And I'm always hot, <laughs> even when it's 60 degrees outside. So double that. That's how much I love you. And the Lord is not sending us to Alaska, although there have been many who have prayed for that. We're going to Gilbert, Lord willing. 10,000 years from now, how will we feel about the decisions that we have to make that are before us? Let pleasing the Lord be the guide. Let that be the goal, to please the Lord. As we move towards a church plant, dozens, hundreds of decisions and implications of those decisions on the two churches and on the individual members will be experienced. Can you imagine what that would be like if the goal of many of us was to please ourselves? But what if our ambition, what if our collective ambition and the assumption of one another's ambition is to please the Lord? Let us resolve that our collective ambition, not as church planners simply, but as Christians, this isn't, this isn't a new goal that we embrace because we're doing this work. This is actually just what we're called to be as Christians and what God intends to produce within his local body to go to the ends of the earth, making disciples, building each other up for the work of ministry. As Christians, as members of this church, we must desire to please the Lord. And lastly, as we wrap up our time this morning, I want to talk about the means what is the means of this desire to please the Lord? The aim that has been uh, on my heart, on Julie and my heart together, has been a life that imitates Jesus. A life imitating Jesus. Turn to Philippians 2 and we'll wrap up with this passage this morning. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Verse 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant or slave, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then you go on to see what God did for Christ in response to his humility, and he exalts him above all else. This aim of being pleasing to the Lord begins in the mind, and it begins in a mind that has resolved to imitate Christ. To set aside selfishness, that's setting aside personal goals or trying to advance your own agenda. A mind that has set aside empty conceit, one where you seek personal glory and you're seeking to advance yourself. But in strong contrast to this selfishness and empty conceit, these advancement of personal goals and personal glory is one who with humility of mind considers others as more important than yourself. This is a deliberate preference of others, not grounded on emotions or some external grounds, but a deliberate regarding of others over and above yourself unconditionally within the body of Christ. This is to be done with humility of mind. There is to be a quality of unselfishness at the mind level. We purposefully think of one another before we think of ourselves. When you heard of our plans to plan a church, did you think of how this will affect those around you and how you might be able to encourage and spur on and enable faithful service, benefiting and blessing those around you? 
Or did you run to all the ways that this decision will inevitably impact you and your comfort? What you want, what you like, what you enjoy. I'm sure all of us have had mixed responses within our own hearts that we've had to navigate, but even pondering this question reveals the intensity and the weight of this call. Because I think for most of us, our natural immediate response is going to be drawn to thinking about ourselves. And what God calls us to do is to consider others. To pay careful attention to, to look out for, to take notice of the interests of others, not just our own. We're aiming for the collective good of the body of Christ. Some in this body will go with the church plant. A lot of the things that we enjoy and experience because of the benefit of others' hard labor will be missing. Are you ready to, at cost to yourself, fill those holes? Are you eager to do that? Are you laboring day by day to pour yourself out into others to raise the bar of maturity in this church to absorb the cost that it takes to do this kind of endeavor? Who are you inviting into your home? Are you actively positioning yourself to be poured into? Omri's equipping hour was so helpful this morning. If you weren't here, you have to go back and listen to it about the church's obligation and and God's intention for counseling to take place within the local church because we want to be built up in Christ. Are you willing to do that? And are you willing to have that done with you? Do you put up barriers and walls? The moment somebody has a question about your godliness or your maturity or your conduct or your parenting or your husbanding or or whatever the case may be, do you immediately put up walls as if those kinds of conversations are off limit? Or do you break down every barrier that exists for somebody to advocate for your whole own personal holiness? If I'm considering others' needs above myself, it will have a direct impact on my approachability because I understand the significance of my own personal holiness and growth on the body. And more than the difficulty emotionally of navigating somebody not thinking you're perfect, we've all been there, (laughs) more important than that difficulty is being useful to the Lord for the building up of his church for the benefit of the body of Christ. These are the kinds of things that we must have our hearts and our minds on as a church. Christ humbled himself to the greatest degree. Nobody started higher and ended lower than Christ. That's the example we're to follow. And what we all must be confronted with in the coming days and weeks and months is what will it look like for me to faithfully please the Lord through sacrificial service for the benefit of this body, to be built up, to maintain the ministry that God has so generously allowed us to experience over the years and to plant and begin a new ministry in the Southeast Valley. Some may hear the news of a church plant and think that sounds exciting and new and this new ministry is is gonna be exciting. And and man, I I love the thought of getting involved in a new ministry. And I, I just wanna warn you, whatever new ministry the Lord has for us is gonna very quickly be the same old ministry that he calls us all to in the body of Christ. So if you're not excited and passionate about the ministry that God calls the local church to be now, Do some work in your own heart to get there because a change of scenery isn't going to change, isn't going to change that for you. You'll be confronted with the, the same apathy, the same distance that you're experiencing now. 
And so whether you stay or whether you go, what each one of us needs to realize is that you, we are an integral part of this endeavor as we're all called to an unwavering commitment to please the Lord through personal holiness as we imitate Christ. We have to start there as a church before we navigate any of the specifics of the needs for the new church and the needs at Grace Bible Church from the holes left. And our, our hope is by the mercies of God that we will press forward in faithfulness. What Christ has done to give us the ability to participate in such tasks is such a privilege, such an honor. I'm sure there are still many questions that you have, and we probably don't have answers for most of them, but in the coming weeks, we'll have opportunity to interact more on these questions. And the next two weeks, John and then Omri are preaching to continue to keep before us all together as a body some crucial principles that we must keep in mind as we ponder what the Lord will have for us as a church body in uh, the coming time. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithful commitment to this church, my life would not be the same without you. And the fact that we get to participate in these things is a privilege beyond measure. It will hurt, there will be tears, relationships will be impacted, but hopefully, Lord willing, eternities will be changed for souls as a result. And whatever cost, whatever cost temporally that we experience, for that aim, it's worth it. It's worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege that it is to be your child, to be your slave, to be your workman. Thank you for the privilege that it is to be under your grace and to be united with you and to be united with one another as the body of Christ. Thank you for the work that you have done through day in and day out faithfulness of so many to pursue what is right and good and sacrifice at great cost, even, even for my edification to be built up. And Lord, we know that I know, I'm very well aware, that apart from your grace, apart from your spirit, I have nothing to offer. And so we recognize that even this very endeavor is not contingent upon something that we can muster up within ourselves, but it is you at work in us. And so we desire to be faithful, we desire to be active, we desire to be intentional, and we desire to be dependent upon you in this endeavor. We know that man plans his ways and the Lord directs his paths. And so, Lord, we want to be intentionally active in our plans and we want to be completely humble and accommodating to what you set before us. Help us to do that. Help us to do that as a church. Help us to love each other well. Help us to please you in our conduct. And as we navigate the various questions and details that will need to be addressed, Lord, help us to please you and help us to imitate Christ. We ask all of these things with a great hope because of what we know to be true about the gospel, what we know to be true about what you've granted to us. And then we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.